And I was very happy that he had made it, but I didn't want him to continue. I started to have concerns for his health. Uh, my name is Pace McKelvin. Uh, and I'm way more tired than the last time we talked. So it's 6.20 p.m. the evening before I'm gonna leave on the Colorado Trail. Biggest bike ride I've ever done. Definitely the scariest bike ride I've ever done. Um, and I don't know why, but I decided that I'm gonna try to do it fast. Uh, I mean, the fact that I'm doing it alone, that I'm, that I'm going bike packing for the first time, I'm doing that alone. My first bike packing trip is the Colorado Trail, which many people will tell you is one of the, one of, if not the hardest bike packing routes there is. And then thirdly, I'm gonna to try to do it fast. So basically none of that makes sense, but here we go. <laughs> on paper, this thing scares me. And usually on paper, things aren't that scary, so. Sort of thinking about, you know, what happens if I get to 23 hours in to that day two, and I've only done 110 miles and I have 70 to go, and I'm out of food, couldn't find water and I'm by myself and it's 28 degrees at 12,000, 13,000 feet. Um, what's that gonna be like? I've never been in that situation. This is very much a discovery mission in a lot of ways. Um, and with that inevitably comes some fear. I mean, to be totally honest, I've had trouble sleeping for probably almost two weeks. Um, I've, a few nights I've gotten good sleep, but uh, I mean, last night I didn't sleep a whole lot. A lot of it is just, mental checklist going over your gear and like, what did I forget? Is this thing that I'm taking stupid? Does this, am I forgetting something? Is this redundant? My hydration, super bright light. I have this little Garmin inReach, an SOS button here, so if something bad happens, should I need an emergency nap? Goo choose, hat. For this ride, I put a 32 on, so four teeth smaller. Chain lube, I have this buff, big 1052, tooth cassette in the back. Also, I am running a dropper post. Spare brake pads, GoPro, a ton of ride food, ibuprofen, toothbrush, toilet paper, Boa lace, Bontrager, triple X ratios, lightweight, well-ventilated helmet. My girlfriend is a medical professional and professional adventurer. So combine those two things and she knows how to put together an adventure medical kit like nobody else. One magnet I've put on the front of this bag and so it's a nice secure double attachment point so I can just, I don't own any of the bike packing gear that's, uh, that's on my bike right now, which is pretty funny. Really, I just wanna go out there and have the experience. I know I'm gonna learn a ton. It may be that going fast isn't in the cards for me this first time, but um, I just really wanted to take advantage of this opportunity during the pandemic year to, to give it a shot. There's just a lot of, uh, a lot of unknowns that make me nervous, but that's also, exciting because typically I operate in an environment with my bike where everything is super controlled. You know, I'm looking at my heart rate, I'm looking at my power meter, literally counting down to the minute when I consume a certain number of calories. Race margins sometimes are, you know, photo finishes or a few seconds. And this is just way more about survival and just getting through. And everyone I've talked to, the the real seasoned bike packers all say that an effort like this is 50% physical and 50% mental. Um, so, we shall see. For three days, all it was was problem solving challenges. Basically just every minute of every day, these days that sort of just merged into one another. Every minute was constant survival in a way, not like fighting for my life, obviously, but just trying to figure out how to keep moving forward and maintain this dream of uh, setting a, a record on this incredible route. I guess what I didn't quite have the experience to understand is that when doing an effort this long, uh, 
the way you need to hold back is if there's a steep climb, you just get off and walk slowly, slowly. You can't just pedal slowly. Like you have to be conserving energy so incredibly aggressively that uh, it almost feels like you're not trying. A really gnarly storm rolled through about a week before I did this. Luckily things, I mean, it's mid-September, so luckily things heated up enough that a lot of the snow melted off, but there were some sections with really deep snow hiking. The record just really wasn't on my mind. It was just getting through every challenge, and the challenges just come thick and fast. I mean, my dad has been a bike packer for quite a while. Uh, he's done the Tour Divide a couple of times, and so I've always been around bike packing gear. I'm so used to my bike being this like speed weapon, and instead it kind of had to get turned into like a, a survival tool. Pretty cool that just with adding some uh, some different bits of gear, you're able to do that to, to a traditional race bike. I bought $90 worth of food and fluids um, at the little Silverton grocery store. Um, and I think I, I was so tired already by that point that I just wandered around this little grocery store with my basket for probably 45 minutes. The clerks were just like, what in the world does this guy do? After I got all that food and fluids in me and Silverton, I felt good again, felt strong. And so I kept pushing into the night. So then I climbed up Stony Pass um, and began Cataract Ridge. Um, had really magical times the first uh, hour or so on Cataract Ridge. All the animals' eyes, you know, lit up by my headlamp was, was really cool. I was a little worried that I'd be, you know, frankly kind of scared in the mountains in the dark by myself, but I loved it. It was so cool. It is 10 o'clock and I'm about out <coughs> I'm at about 12,000 feet, no, 12,500 feet. 10 o'clock at night, enjoying the hell out of this Lunchable. High point of the Colorado Trail. 2 a.m. and I'm very thoroughly cracked. I'm gonna go drop some elevation and try to find a place to jump in the emergency bivy. In terms of equipment choices, I took only an emergency bivy and a sleeping pad. When I pulled out my emergency bivy at about 5 a.m., 4 a.m., there right before Jerosa Mesa, it sort of felt warm for a second you know, maybe two or three minutes. And then I just started shivering uncontrollably along, despite wearing everything I had. Um, and I thought, well, maybe you're so tired you can fall asleep while you're shivering uncontrollably. And then about 20, 30 minutes after waiting, I realized that wasn't realistic. What I ended up doing in hindsight was pretty dumb also, but I didn't know, I was just trying to problem solve. Um, I got up, I got on my bike, without a helmet on, I'm remembering now, and I just sp started sprinting up the trail, <laughs> trying to get warm. And so I basically did this all out effort until I was really, really exhausted, like the hardest I'd gone all day, just trying to get as warm as I could as quickly as I could. Turned around, coasted back down the trail, and jumped straight into my emergency bivy with the heart rate at like 175 beats per minute. And as I lay there, I was like, oh, I feel so warm. This is wonderful. Also, I'm breathing incredibly hard and my heart rate is completely pegged. I wonder if I can fall asleep with my heart rate at 175. And about 10 minutes later, I realized, no, that's not a thing you can do. And also at about 10 minutes later, I started shivering uncontrollably, uncontrollably again. Long story short, completely gave up on sleeping. This was about a two hour process of just looking like a complete dumbass in the mountains, basically. Got up, packed up all my stuff, had a little snack, pressed on. These highs and lows just can come so quickly. 
and the highs can be so, so high and you're convinced that you're unstoppable. And then the lows can be so low that you think you're about to die. At least I, that's how I felt. There were times where I thought, you know, I might keel over and not wake up. And then there are other times where it made zero sense for me to f be feeling really good, but I was feeling amazing. There were probably, I don't know, a hundred down trees between Durango and Silverton. So many really big trees down. And then there was a several mile section on in the Monarch Crest Trail area that was hands down the gnarliest tree fall area I'd ever seen, so much so that as I was climbing through the trees, you couldn't tell where the trail was at all. And I ended up um, getting quite lost. And uh, even with a little GPS tracker, um, had some pretty scary moments there in the middle of the night in the dark, just trying to find the trail again, let alone move forward on it. I don't know if it's ever truly happened, but I think maybe for the first time, I'm honestly breaking emotionally on the bike. It's just so disappointing how many trees are down. Things were going so well and there's just hundreds of trees down. I got the dreaded uh, in-reach message that he was lost and that he was battling with hundreds of downed trees and my heart just kind of jumped a little bit because I knew that of all the things that can go wrong, not being able to spin when you're cold and needing to you know, use muscles that are not your legs to carry the bike over trees, it's really challenging. Just as the sun was rising for real, I saw this huge moose in a pond and it was so beautiful and made me so happy I'd heard that people have hallucinations on this sort of ride, and so I thought, I'm definitely imagining that moose. Like right now, my body and my mind are so annihilated that I'm, my body is, my, my brain is just making one last ditch effort to make me happy. This moose does not exist. And I stopped, and there was someone else there with binoculars. And just to be sure, I looked at them and I said, wow, look at that moose. And they said, yeah, look at that moose. <laughs> really nice. My understanding was the further I got from Durango, the easier the riding would get. And then you start what's called Marshall Pass, which I knew nothing about. I'd heard the name, but I, I didn't know anything about it. Um, it looked uh, not too bad. Uh, it looked like it had some steep sections, but um, you know everything I'd heard was about you know Indian Trail Ridge and uh, Cataract Ridge and Jerosa Mesa and Sargent Mesa, and so I assumed you know couldn't be too bad. It was one of those sections where I think out loud I was just saying things like, "Why?" is this where the trail is? Because you just go straight up, there are never any switchbacks. It goes straight up this mountain, it's just a boulder field. Um, big ledges that you have to hike up. Um, I walked for, I don't know, it felt like an hour. Marshall Pass is unfucking believable I've been pushing my bike for probably an hour, maybe more. This is not even a trail I'd want to hike. And then I started getting into windfall trees. So many trees down. And I summited Monarch Crest Trail, which I'm pretty sure is above tree line. It was a little bit hard to tell. And there was snow everywhere. And I knew I had a 12 mile single track descent, one of the most famous in the world. Um, it was obviously pitch black dark. I was just riding along and all of a sudden my foot just was off. And I thought that I had unclipped, because that happens sometimes when you when there's a big jarring impact, your foot just unclips. And I looked down and there's just the spindle attached to the crank and the pedal was still attached to my foot. And it kind of, I was in such shock because I knew that was the end of the record attempt. And it happened so fast. <laughs> For 30 hours previously, I'd been fighting tooth and nail, problem solving, trying to feed myself well, trying to make these decisions that incrementally 
would make for a more efficient ride. And then all of a sudden, just in an instant, all of that changed. And it was so weird to have spent so much time like fighting, 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 making these little bits of progress. And then just, it all just like vaporized. I saw um, a text come through that said um, emergency. And I, you know, I knew that I had fallen asleep. So I, I couldn't even process to look at what time he had sent the message. I just like immediately panicked because I had fallen asleep. And the message said that he needed help and that he had um, blown up his pedal and was unable to ride. And he was just at the road intersection, um, kind of at the bottom of Monarch Pass. And I didn't really know what the rest of the night was going to look like, but I knew that he needed help quickly. And so I called his team manager, John. I don't know that they knew what the what my intentions were. I think maybe they thought that I was calling for a rescue, like to get in the car and to be done. John pulled up and he basically said, um, you know, I think we should probably call it at this point. Um, it's like, no, give me, give me your pedal, please. When he got down there, um, Payson didn't want to quit. And he knew that accepting support meant that the fastest known time aspect of the ride was over. I, at that point, it was, you know, I was able to actually talk to him and see how he was doing. And I think that's when I just became really inspired by what the ride meant to him because it wasn't a question of whether he wanted to push on, he wanted to go forward. We did get him up and running and he is such a trooper, he moved forward and said, I want to keep going, even though I started to have concerns for his health. The depth of the cold and hiking, the hike-a-bike and the trees down, so it was very tough for me to see him ride away in those conditions. I was on a working bike again, you know, the pedal had been replaced. And at the end of the day, setting records or winning races feels good, but we're all here just trying to prove something to ourselves and, and have really significant, you know, personal journeys and, and address these personal challenges. And that's really what this was all about all along. So while we were setting up, uh, waiting for Payson to arrive at Twin Lakes, we got a visitor uh, by the name of Jesse Jacomait, who is the uh, current uh, fastest known time holder for the Colorado Trail. And he just popped into the picture and wanted to know how Payson was doing. And I don't know, it was kind of a, it was a fun conversation to have just because uh, he knows exactly what Payson was experiencing. And so we kind of just chatted through kind of some of the challenges that Payson was having. I think probably the most interesting thing that Jesse said to me was just the toll that this type of adventuring had done on his body. He actually told me that the nerve damage that he had to his hands was so extreme that he wasn't able to do those rides anymore. He told me, I'm not really a mountain biker anymore. He's done this thing in three days and just under 21 hours uh, from Durango to Denver. And um, I knew that it had taken him five tries to do that. Um, five attempts, it still just blows my mind. I'm glad I didn't know that going in because I'm not sure I would have done it. Um, and also, I, I, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure Nicole told me that when I stopped in, in Leadville. She said, yeah, we saw Jesse and you know, he made this mention of uh, of having these permanent health issues because of what you're doing. And um, it really kind of made me stop and think for a minute, even in the delirium there. And um, I kind of wondered what was happening to my body. Cause when you're in the zone and you're just going for it, you kind of push everything else away other than just focusing on how to move forward. I started doing a little bit more, I took a moment to do a little more assessment, just personal assessment there about how I was doing physically because I knew mentally I was still hanging in there. I realized that I was in a pretty bad way physically actually and I hadn't admitted that to myself and 
Um, I did start to wonder what sort of damage I was doing. We were starting to notice some sort of weird health things beyond just fatigue. Um, my hands and feet had been numb for quite a while, um, despite it not being terribly cold during the day hours. His face and hands were so swollen that his, he was having a hard time keeping his eyes open. And I had this absolutely awful rattle uh, in my chest, and I was having some trouble drawing full breaths of air. I could only get what I felt like was half a breath at a time. Uh, I was getting these periods of coughing that sounded awful, worst sounding cough I've ever had, and every breath was just this deep wheeze um, that sounded pretty bad. And I'm pretty familiar with what we call race cough. I mean, you get that after just about any bike race, but this was next level something. <coughs> But I was still really determined and um, basically convinced everyone that I should keep going. But please really keep a close eye on my tracker because coming up is uh, Tennessee or is Kokomo Pass, um, which heads to Searle Pass, I believe. And on the course profile, it looked absolutely awful. Heading up Kokomo, I finally started to get warm because it is the most insane wrestling match I've ever had with a trail. I, I don't know how the math adds up, why it says it's an average of 10% grade, but more than half of it is walking. Um, it's the steepest climb, the steepest extended climb I've ever seen in my life. Um, I literally felt like my Achilles tendons were going to explode. I felt like I was just going to, I didn't even feel like I was on this planet anymore. It just felt like it felt like actual hell, honestly. Starting to feel pretty dire, and um, I got to the top of Kokomo, and I, I think I that took me about an hour 40 of, of trudging at two miles an hour. That was the hardest climb I've ever done. And it was so cold on top. All the little creek crossings were frozen over. Um, then you, you just start traversing above tree line at like 12,600 feet. And then I knew I was actually in hell. I was like, I don't know when this ends. According to the map, I thought I'd drop down to copper now. And it just kept rolling and rolling. And I started to have really close calls with crashes. Um, and it just started to get really sketchy. And I, I, the thought came to me as I, you know, would get off my bike and hike up a section, jump back up on my bike. Now and then I would get off my bike and I would sort of trip or my legs would give out a little bit and I'd lose balance and the bike would kind of pull me over and we'd both fall over on the side of the trail. And I thought, you know, I wonder if there's a scenario here in which I kind of fall over and I can't get up. And, you know, I, I get kind of hypothermic um, and I, I do not make it out of this. Um, I know that sounds a little dramatic, but that thought did cross my mind. But eventually I did finally make it to the descent descended very slowly, made it down, um, and uh, made it to Copper Resort. I was very happy that he had made it, but I didn't want him to continue. He, um, and I knew that he couldn't continue. His physical place, um, he was lucky to make it out of, of the trail down to Copper without being injured. And I was just completely broken. Um, I'd finally, I hadn't really broken mentally until that point. But I think I had worried, I had got, I would started to worry just enough about my health that um, I pretty much broke mentally finally at that point too. And I think the other thing is, in a way, I'd gotten what I'd came, come there for. Um, we always talk about in bike racing, you know, finding the limit and pushing yourself to your limit and discovering your limits and pushing to new limits. This whole experience on the Colorado Trail made me realize that all of my years bike racing, bike riding, doing really hard bike rides, I'd never actually found my limit. Made the call then um, that he was gonna be done and he got into the van and then um, kind of was shivering uncontrollably for more than an hour um, in a sleeping bag with the heat on in the van. And his cough um, was really, He'd go through these spells of coughing for 45 seconds um, and then not be able to catch his breath. And just the 
sound of the wet cough that he had made me afraid that he might have pulmonary edema. I was really happy that he was able to make the call to stop because he knew at that point that his health was being compromised and that um, it was possible that he would actually need um, medical attention. It feels a lot better to have the story be that I got in the van and got driven to Denver and got in a cozy hotel room rather than having to hit the SOS button on my inReach. I just kept pressing on and testing myself and seeing how far I could continue to press on without quitting was pretty much what I'd come there for and I had achieved that and um, honestly I'd never been more proud of quitting something and having a DNF next to uh, my name ever. I am so impressed with the folks that do this race and try to really maximize how fast they can go. I am so glad I had the experience. I learned so much about myself. I learned so much about being in the mountains in a responsible way, which isn't always what I did um, during the last few days. I certainly am willing to admit that. The mountains and the route totally beat me this time, and you know, that's okay. You need to have that reminder now and then, I think, um, that you're not fitter, you're not better, um, you're not more prepared, you're not tougher than Mother Nature and, and the mountains. How cool is this? And uh, yeah, I'm gonna take a huge amount away from, from that experience uh, for the rest of my life, I think. And these people, their stories need to be told more. I mean, um, cross-country racers have pretty significant followings, a lot of them in the bike racing world. Um, and, you know, not as many bike pack riders do, bike pack racing riders, and uh, I think they should. Um, some of them would say they don't want that, understandably. Um, but uh, I want more people to know what this is about, because um, it's very unique and, um, I don't think too many, and you can't know. Like you can't know how insane it is um, until you've done it. Uh, but you know, hopefully through some storytelling, people can get a little bit more of a peek into it. I don't know, man. That's about all I got.